again, a couple quick things before we do our clicker questions. Office hours next week, um, I'll be having extra office hours from 11 to noon in SRTC, room 432 on Monday, Tuesday from 1 to 3, um, also in room 432. Um, please feel free to send me emails, etc. When's the exam? Wednesday at 10.15, daylight time. Don't forget the time is changing this weekend. So just to make things even more complicated, you will have one less hour to study. It won't make a difference. It really won't, trust me. Speaking of making differences, uh, I did also post the fifth edition of the textbook discussion about fly sex determination and sex lethal, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So the PDF is now up online on D2L. Questions about the exam at this point? No, it's not written. Yes, there'll be 50 multiple choice questions. What will be on everything? Um, and it's, yeah, it's not cumulative, um, other than the things that I'll expect you to have known otherwise. <clears throat> So the last two clicker questions of the term, sigh. Uh, <laughs> there's a protein-protein interaction in a two-hybrid screen. You would detect it by observing a larger molecule in the SCS page, an electrophoretic mobility shift, co-precipitation, gene expression, or translational silencing. Feel free to discuss. Those of you who are taking virology next term should be warned there will be clear questions throughout the lecture, not just at the beginning. Ten, five, we have liftoff. Um, yes, it is gene expression. That's the point uh, of the protein-protein interaction with two hybrid is you're looking at fusion proteins between a DNA binding protein and your one protein of interest and an activation domain and the other proteins of interest. And the really critical thing about this is this is happening in vivo. It's inside a cell. So all the rest of the machinery is there for gene expression, et cetera. So D is the correct answer. Last one of the term. We ready? <laughs> Dideoxy, capillary, and aluminum sequencing all depend on the activity of which of the following enzymes? DNA ligase, DNA polymerase, DNA protein kinase, polynucleotide kinase, or RNA polymerase. Uh, 
ten, five, four, three, two, one. There we are. Polling is stopped. Uh, <clears throat> so it turns out that there is a really fascinating DNA sequencing technique that's dependent on ligase, which we didn't talk about, called solid sequencing. Uh, all of the dideoxy, any kind of chain extension for sequencing does depend, of course, on DNA polymerase. You know, incorporating dideoxynucleotides depends on DNA polymerase. The capillary is just a way of separating all the pieces that you've made after DNA polymerase. Uh, the Illumina sequencing is adding on individual nucleotides through the activity of DNA polymerase. What this means is that you're not actually sequencing the actual DNA that's there. You're actually making a copy of that and using the copy to determine what the sequence is. And a lot of people forget this. In fact, many researchers forget this. Um, and it turns out to be a real problem if you're trying to sequence DNA, or for that matter, RNA, that's hard to get a DNA polymerase through. So if you've got huge amounts of secondary structure, um, we in fact had an example of this for months. A honor student in my lab had trouble sequencing one little piece of DNA because it was GC, 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 and it all base paired like crazy to itself. Um, so there are some issues with that, and some of the newest, the next, next, next generation techniques literally are sequencing individual DNA molecules. And so <clears throat> that's the slight difference now, um, what's going on there. So that's it for clicker questions. Enjoy. So uh, again, as usual, I'm going to go through and just talk about the highlights, lowlights, stuff that I did a bad job explaining the first time around. Um, please stop me as we go. I'm going to be going relatively quickly through this stuff. So um, first one actually is not so much this particular image and what we talked about the first time around. Um, this is an example of RNA sequencing. And so RNA-seq deep sequencing. Um, we talked about it really briefly then. But basically, if you take the RNA from a cell, and instead of doing a cDNA library, um, trying to sequence the whole genome, here what you do is you just get the RNA, make very short, in this case you're usually up to 100 nucleotide pieces of the complementary DNA and sequence those. And since you've got so many of them, almost always this is done through the massively parallel sequencing, so you've got literally millions and millions, in some cases even billions, of little short RNA sequences. And so or the cDNA sequences correspond to the RNA. And so you can go back and look at where these RNA sequences are relative to the genome. And so here's the genome up here. All the RNA sequences are down here. So these will be hundreds, if not thousands, of individual RNA sequences that match with this particular part of your gene. And so it's just one way of looking at gene expression. This particular one is the example of a gene which is being made in almost all cells most of the time. It's a cytoskeletal protein, of course, actin. Um, which is being used here. You also see here that there's some RNAs in the introns that are being made. And that corresponds to the background level of transcription that's happening all the time for pretty much the whole genome, unless it's massively silenced. So <clears throat> the idea there is that you're seeing all of these RNAs which are being made. This is really important for RNA-induced transcriptional silencing, thinking about repeated DNA sequences. The fact that you have these repeated DNA sequences that don't necessarily have any protein coding potential, any kind of repeated sequence, there's going to be a little bit of transcription of that. So these are sort of the two things that I wanted to mention here. Yeah? What, what exactly is the y-axis? The y-axis here is number of reads, number of sequences that you have at that particular position. So this is depending on, oh, sorry, the, the question is here, what does the y-axis represent? Sorry that people didn't get that before. Uh, but what the y-axis represents is number of times you have that single nucleotide in a given sequence. So you've got literally billions of sequences, 
which will have that particular nucleotide in the appropriate context a certain number of times. And the more times you have it, the higher the y-axis is going to be. OK, this is um, someone, I forget who it was, thank you, uh, mentioned to me that this was mixed up, it was backwards. Um, here in the <clears throat> major group of DNA, blues, of course, are not hydrogen bond acceptors. They're hydrogen bond donors. And reds are hydrogen bond acceptors. So, but the take home message here is still the same. In double stranded DNA, most of the information is in the major groove, and you can determine just by looking at what the chemicals are in the major groove what that base pair is. You don't have to pull the two strands apart to recognize DNA in a sequence specific fashion. And so all the DNA binding proteins that we've talked about in this part of the course, amps of helicases, et cetera, are all binding to double-stranded DNA, and that double-stranded DNA is staying together. And these are just those um, examples here of what they look like. No, I'm not expecting you to draw base pairs. That would have been for the first exam if we'd had that question on it. What is usually interacting with these base pairs in the major group? Almost always an alpha helix. This is just one of the examples of the alpha helical motifs that are going to be binding to DNA. These are the helix turn helix motifs, which you find in bacteria. All of the other DNA binding motifs that we've talked about are found in both eukaryotes and in bacteria. HTHs are just in bacteria. I have that funky term for the homeodomain. The homeodomain looks a little bit like a helix turn helix, but it's a full domain, has three alpha helices, and is going to fold up into a specific structure that's specific to eukaryotes. So helix turn helix, bacteria, homeodomain, eukaryotes. Yes, good, no, huh? Um, it's the end of the term. My brain's full. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that I wanted to emphasize here are the dimerization motifs, which are not DNA binding motifs. Turn my pen back on here. If you look at a leucine zipper containing protein, the leucine zipper is just this part. It's not the part down at the bottom. So leucine zippers are involved in dimerization. Something attached to a leucine zipper may or may not bind to DNA. But here, if we're talking about a leucine zipper, it's just this part up here at the top, not interacting with the DNA. Yeah. So can I make crystal clear the difference between motif and domain? Motif is a sequence, an amino acid sequence, which can, in the context of the rest of a protein, end up having a function. And to have that function, it has to have a structure. But it's only been the context of the rest of a protein. However, domain, by definition, has its own structure. Good? OK, same thing is true over here with the helix loop helix motif. Helix loop helix is important for dimerization. It's not DNA binding. Hopefully I've beat that horse so much that it's really, really, really dead. Good. <clears throat> so um, why do we care so much about dimers? Um, dimers are really important for all kinds of different things, mostly because dimers can bind to individual half sites or half sequences that you then can put right next to each other. And so the example here is we've got dark green binding to light green and sort of light blue binding to light blue. Um, these are different sequences on either side here, They're different colors. This is going to be a heterodimer. Um, and it's having these two half sites next to each other, which really gives you the specificity. One alpha helix sitting in the major group of DNA is only going to be able to interact with probably at most four or five base pairs. 
four or five base pairs, particularly in a genome the size of the human genome, it's going to happen at random a whole bunch. However, if you have two sets of five to six bases right next to each other, that's going to happen at a very low frequency, even in something as big as the human genome. So you've got each of those monomers that will then interact with specific sequences. The other great thing about dimers is that you can mix and match. If you have dimerization domains, and then your different, or dimerization motifs, different DNA binding motifs, you can mix and match these with each other. So you can have combinatorial control very easily that way. The third thing, which is really nice about dimers, which is outlined here, is if you have <clears throat> the protein-protein interactions that are relatively weak, what you can end up with is cooperative binding. So the dimer binds really well to DNA, but the individual monomers don't bind very well to the DNA. And what that means is you have a much sharper transition from completely unbound to completely bound than you would if in just the case of a single protein, which is like in this case where the dimers are all very tightly associated with each other. So three things that are useful for dimers. One, your specificity. Um, two, protein-protein interactions um, in terms of getting cooperativity. And three, being able to mix and match. So one of those techniques that's not in our textbook but really should be, um, as far as I'm concerned, the electrophoretic mobility shift assay or band shift assay. A number of people have asked me what an assay is. Um, an assay is just a way of trying to figure out what your protein, enzyme, et cetera, is actually doing. And so here, what you're looking for is a DNA binding protein or a whole selection of DNA binding proteins. The way that you figure out if your protein is binding to DNA, you have a radioactively labeled DNA or labeled in some way. And then in the absence of protein, it has one particular electrophoretic mobility. In the presence of a protein or multiple proteins, it's now shifted. It has a different mobility. And that's all that this is. This is an example of column chromatography, which we'll hopefully get to a little bit later on. Any individual fraction that you get off of a column, and that's what this is supposed to represent here, will have one particular kind of activity. So each of these fractions you'll do the assay on to see do, does the protein which is in this fraction have a particular activity. In this case, it's binding to a particular DNA. So the question is here, do you see cooperativity? Sorry, if I get the, the question wrong, correct me. Uh, is this also going to be true for homodimers? This is going to be true for any dimerization which is happening. So cooperativity can be a homodimer cooperativity, heterodimer cooperativity. It doesn't matter. It's a general case. <clears throat> Another one of the assays that we've talked about is trying to figure out what DNA sequence, your favorite protein, YFP, um, is interacting with inside the cell. So this process, you have your cell, all of the DNA binding proteins that are associated with the DNA in this cell get bound to the DNA. And when you say cross-linking, that's a covalent bond that forms between your protein and your DNA. Once you've made a covalent bond here, it's basically to get the DNA to stick to the protein after you blast open the cell, which is the next thing you do, break the DNA into little pieces, and then use an antibody to your favorite protein. And so this is the immuno part of this. Whenever people say immuno, it means that you've got some kind of antibody there. The precipitation here, this happens like the GST fusion proteins that we talked about last time. It's a bead, it's a big thing that will then bind specifically to antibodies. And then the only antibodies which are in there are going to be interacting with your protein. So the only things which are going to precipitate, because they're attached to these big beads, uh, are going to be the things that have an antibody that's associated with them. So that would be your protein. Your protein is 
covalently bonded to DNA, which you have up here at the top, and that way you can isolate this particular DNA that you have here and sequence it. You can sequence this DNA and then say, oh, back in the cell up here, we had the interaction of this particular protein with this particular DNA. Okay, and that is, again, that was described chapter 8, um, some of the stuff there. <clears throat> wanted to talk about the lac operon. Um, this is a really nice example of gene regulation in bacteria. Um, it'll be there. <laughs> so <clears throat> here this is looking at gene regulation. In fact, this is the very first example of gene regulation ever to be discovered or described. And that was looking at the lactose repressor. But backing up here, operators are sequences in the DNA which are regulating transcription of some gene, or in bacteria very often a set of genes, which are right next to it. So the operator, again, it's a DNA sequence. This operator binds to the lac repressor. And that was what was found by Jacob and Minot in this very first example. So negative regulation. The negative regulation here is you have binding by a repressor. The binding by the repressor will block transcription. In this particular case, the operon is involved in breaking down lactose. So in the presence of lactose, you want to be expressing the genes. In the absence of lactose, you don't want to be expressing the genes. So here, in the <clears throat> absence of lactose, your lactose repressor binds. As was very well noticed earlier, um, here you'll notice that the operon is off in both of these two cases. Well, how the heck did Jacob Minot figure out how gene regulation was going on that was all negative regulation that was happening? Well, they happened to be growing their cells in the absence of glucose. And in the absence of glucose, you have the presence of an activator protein, which is the cap protein, that will stimulate binding of the polymerase. So repressors are going to block binding of the polymerase, and activators are going to stimulate binding of the polymerase. And this is also true in eukaryotic systems. It's just this is the very basic one um, here in bacteria. So in the lac operon, these are the experiments that they did. It was all in the absence of glucose, but they had no idea they were doing all this in the absence of glucose. And they didn't know that there was any other regulation going on. They just were looking at the repressors, so they thought it was all negative regulation. But now we know when you grow in the presence of glucose, you have no cyclic AMP. If you have no cyclic AMP, CAP does not bind to DNA, so you don't have expression. On the other hand, in the absence of glucose, which is what Jacob and Minot were using, then you have binding by the polymerase, stimulated by the activator protein, lack of repressor, so you end up with expression of the operon. So it's a really nice example of combinatorial control. We've got a repressor, we have an activator, and only under the appropriate conditions are you going to have expression of the gene. Yeah? Do you think this is an unusually simple case of how it works, just in real biology, like if it's just like some pretty discrete control system in a real world bacteria or something like this? So the, the basic question is, is biology messier than this? And the answer, of course, is yes, biology is messy. Um, but this and particular case works really well, and it's great for understanding sort of the basics and looking at a few promoters, and it turns out that this one is almost exactly regulated in this way. <laughs> uh, but the whole idea is the combinatorial control. Usually you have way more than two, and we'll look at that in just a second, um, and way more than one activator and one repressor. Okay, so the question is, is operon specific to DNA? And, you, and you're going to be talking about the um, set of genes that are there. So the operator was defined, in fact, originally in this system. And so the operator and the operon was what was being acted on by the operator. And the operator is clearly a DNA sequence that proteins are going to be interacting with. So the answer is yes, DNA, but that's a long-winded way of, of, of answering your question.
Yes, so getting back to your question about you know, complexity, um, this is much more like what's happening at most eukaryotic promoters and in a lot of bacterial promoters as well. Um, and that is that you have the RNA polymerase, all of these other general transcription factors, TF2D, TF2B, TF2H, et cetera, um, TF2F, a number of activator proteins that bind to DNA next to that, lots of activator proteins that bind a long way away, some of those associated with coactivators, some activators that don't need coactivators. You've got this mediator complex, which is sort of between some of these. Some of these are going to interact with mediator. Some interact directly with the RNA polymerase. You can have sequences upstream of your promoter. You can have sequences downstream of your promoter. This is much more like what's actually going on at most promoters. Another thing that I wanted to mention here in terms of promoters, um, if you just do a chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment with TF2D or even with RNA polymerase itself, you find it binds at about 70,000 places in the eukary uh, sorry, human genome, about 20,000 protein coding genes. So what this tells you, about 50,000 specific places that transcription starts. We don't know what about 50,000 of those things are doing. So we have a whole bunch more to try and learn about how all of these things um, are getting put together. I mentioned gene activator proteins being modular right at the beginning. We talked about the two hybrid screen. This is basically the original experiment showing that that was the case. If you have a eukaryotic transcriptional activator, it's got two different domains, which are going to have each of their own structures. The structures are going to have different functions. This particular one is a nice simple one, just has a DNA binding domain and an activation domain. If you have a DNA binding domain and an activation domain that associates with DNA close enough to a promoter without any insulator elements between it, then that can activate transcription. If, however, you change the DNA binding domain so it can't bind to DNA, you're not going to be stimulating transcription but it just depends on this DNA binding domain. You can change the sequence of the DNA to a completely different sequence here. This by itself, just this DNA, if you only had this activator protein, is not going to be functional. However, it's got the right DNA binding domain. The activation domain doesn't care. And this is why the two hybrid screen works, is that you can mix and match all of these different domains relative to each other. It's not just DNA binders. Um, we have co-activators and co-repressors. These are very often going to be proteins that are going to have some effect on chromatin. So chromatin remodeling complexes, histone acetyl transferases, histone methyl transferases, et cetera which are only going to be brought near the promoter if they interact with DNA binding proteins. So they don't bind them by themselves, but through protein-protein interactions and getting back to your question about cooperativity, interactions, this kind of thing, also same kind of way. It, only when you have high enough concentrations of everything are you going to get binding, and it's going to be very much an on-off situation because of the cooperativity that you have interacting here. Uh, here I like this version of the textbook better than the older ones because in some cases you even have an RNA here, a non-coding RNA that helps bridge between some of these coactivators and DNA binding proteins. We talked about a number of examples of specific gene regulation. This one seems to always be the one that I get the most questions about in office hours. Uh, this is regulation of one gene, the even skip gene, but only part of the expression of one gene in the Drosophila embryo, just in stripe 2. And the reason that we use this example is a relatively simple one, because we only have four different proteins that are involved in regulation here, as opposed to many more in a lot of cases. Uh, and they are activators and repressors. And so if you look at 
just the regulatory region for the stripe 2 expression. You can take that DNA sequence, regulatory sequence, put it in front of a reporter gene. That will lead to expression of whatever reporter gene you have only in this particular region. And the region, reason for that is that you have these two activators, hunchback and vicoid, which are present in this particular part of the embryo. But you don't have this repressor protein or this repressor protein. And that's shown by the green lines here. And so the only place that your stretch of DNA, the enhancer for stripe 2, is going to be able to be active and stimulate transcription is right here in this one particular part of the embryo. Yes, no, hey. <laughs> two thumbs up. OK, well, at least two out of, what, 90 of you? Well, actually, no, there's about 12 of you left after everyone left. Uh, no. <clears throat> so the, that's, that's what's happening in a simple case. In a much more complex case, um, you can take differentiated cells, put in three regulatory proteins, and these can actually be three different gene regulatory proteins, depending on what cell you're working with. And you can basically de-differentiate this cell. And the de-differentiation process giving you an induced pluripotent stem cell. The induction is by adding these three proteins. And from that, given the appropriate signals, you can get these pluripotent stem cells to basically differentiate into everything, and in some cases, even a whole organism. Uh, this is a huge breakthrough in terms of hopefully being able to have patient-specific therapies, because this cell now has the genetic information of that particular person. Particularly important are going to be, of course, all of the immune system, the MHCs, et cetera, of that one particular person. So this could be really personalized therapy by expression of these um, individual genes. So multiple different, all kinds of feedback patterns, ex uh, repression, activation, et cetera. Um, it still blows me away that expression of three proteins can do this. It's still, um, and people are still trying to figure out exactly how it's working. And then, again, there's lots more information on these if you're interested in taking a look at it. I did post some more information on Mating type switching. This is what happens in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and in fact, lots of different yeasts. Um, these yeasts can have two different sexes, if you want to think about them that way, alpha and A, and they switch back and forth. How the heck can they do that? Well, it's because all of them, doesn't matter what sex they are, have copies of the alpha-specific genes and the A-specific genes. These are in so-called silent loci. They're parts of the genome that are not being expressed. Why are they not being expressed? They're insulated through the silencers, but they also are in heterochromatin. And chromatin remodeling complexes make sure that these are silent. One of the big things that these proteins actually do is change silencing that's happening in a lot of genes. Probably that's really important for getting these IPS cells. So this <clears throat> silencing process, this gene is silenced, these genes are silenced, until they get moved into this other part of the genome, which is not silenced. And that movement process is not exactly like double-stranded break repair, but it's really similar to double-stranded break repair. So there's a cut that happens in this part of your genome. Copy either from here or from here will come in there. Turns out if it was this copy that was there before, it gets replaced by this copy. If it's this copy that was there, it gets replaced by this copy. And then these genes, which are present now at this position, are regulatory proteins, which will lead to either A-specific development or alpha-specific development. And we just lost one of our pictures here, which I thought I'd taken care of, but so be it. Um, <clears throat> with our lambda, this is now getting into thinking about regulatory systems and how these regulatory systems are 
working? That's bizarre. Two copies of this, okay. with no slide at all. Um, positive feedback loops and repression of other genes. And so in the case of lambda, this is a bacterial virus, infects the cell, and then decides whether it's going to blast open that cell and make a whole bunch more, more virions, the extracellular part of the virus, or if it's just going to hang out inside the genome of that particular microbe and wait as long as the going is good um, and not produce any more of the virus. The way this works is through two different positive feedback loops. The lambda repressor positive feedback loop makes more of the lambda repressor gene because the lambda repressor actually is an activator of its own gene transcription. It's the classic positive feedback loop. But that lambda repressor, not surprisingly, also has a repressor activity. That's how they found it. It represses all the genes that will be required for lysis bursting open the cell. On the other hand, if the decision is made, the switch is made to go and <clears throat> lyse the cell, then you express CRO, which represses the lambda repressor, and then allows transcription of all the other things. And so we had long talks about this. This is a flip-flop. Is it a positive feedback loop? The answer is yes. It's both, because you have repressors that are interacting with each other, and then activators which are activating each other as well. So that was the genetic switch, these pictures, which I'm getting a new computer next term, so hopefully that's not going to be happening. Yes? Do we need to understand how you can switch back and forth or just know the functions of those uh, two, lambda repressor and lambda crow? So the question is, how much do you need to know about the process of switching from one to the other? The answer is, I don't know yet because I haven't finished writing the exam. Okay, so how does it switch from one to the other? <laughs> so how it switches from one to the other is that it's really the lambda repressor which is critical for keeping that positive feedback loop. And we talked a little bit about the positive feedback loops and how you escape from positive feedback loops. If you get rid of that positive feedback loop with the lambda repressor by chewing it up, then you're going to go in the opposite direction. And so that's the switch, the switch that happens between once you're inside the cell and going from hanging out inside the cell to making a whole bunch of new virions that can go out and infect other cells, that's going to be getting rid of that positive feedback loop. The answer to the other question, which is how the cell decides whether to go with crow or lambda repressor at the beginning, take virology next term. We'll talk about it. But it won't be on the exam. Any other questions on lambda repressor without any extra figures? Although they should be in the notes. OK, so <clears throat> let's continue. Um, talk about X inactivation. Um, X inactivation is sort of the first example that we talked about of a long non coding RNA having specific activity. And so the long non coding RNA here is the XIST RNA, which is made from the XIC locus, X inactivation center. Um, it's just a pretty standard gene, makes lots of this RNA. This RNA doesn't code for anything, but what it does is it will bind to mostly itself, and as long as it binds to itself, it will continue to bind to itself, ends up coding the whole X chromosome on which it has been expressed. But it's not just the coding of the RNA. These long non-coding RNAs, like the other long non-coding RNAs that we've talked about, also interact with proteins, and these will be histone deacetylases, they'll be in histone methyltransferases, they'll be histone chaperones that allow exchange of H2A, and DNA methyltransferases that will methylate the DNA. So all of these things are interacting with the XAST large non-coding RNA. So that brings us to how you can have this state, i.e. the inactivated state of the X chromosome or a positive feedback loop inherited from generation to generation. So in the case of, case of methylation, all that we're talking about here is we have an unmethylated DNA, say this was your X chromosome, the very beginning of development, 
This then gets methylated, one of the X chromosomes, that will stay methylated even after it gets replicated because of the maintenance methyltransferase. So anytime you have hemimethylated, so one strand is methylated, the other strand will get methylated just because of the presence of this uh, maintenance methyltransferase, which is there. So once methylated, stay methylated until, as we talked about for imprinting, you go through germline development and you get rid of all of those uh, methyl groups. But in your normal replication, the change in the DNA, just due to the methylation, not a change in sequence, can be maintained because of this maintenance methyltransferase. Very similar things happen if you have modified chromatin. That chromatin modification, because of the histone read writer complexes, that will bind to one modified histone and cause the same modification on a histone right next to it, those will also allow you to have the state of a DNA, i.e. expressed or not expressed, maintained after cell division and after replication takes place. So these are all modifications that happen due to some kind of modification after replication and also being right next to where that modification takes place. So if you have your maintenance methyltransferase, it's going to methylate on the opposite strand, right next to or in cis relative to where you had that first change. We also have inheritable changes that can happen with expression of a protein that's way away from what is regulating, um, and that would be those positive feedback loops. Here we have now a soluble protein which is activating itself. And when you have cell division, cells divide, there are two cytoplasms. Those two cytoplasms are going to have some of that particular protein after you've had division. And so that will lead to, in these positive feedback loop cases, more production of that same protein. Um, this is happening in trans because these are diffusible elements which are there. Same thing happens, we haven't really talked about it too much, with the change in the folding state of a protein, the amyloid proteins. So questions about this? This is, a, again, a gross oversimplification of epigenetics, and these are just four different mechanisms that you can have in terms of inheritance that is not based on a genetic change. Okay, so we'll talk about a few more regulatory things here. These are the ones that, again, I just posted the <clears throat> PDF of this from the last version of the textbook. Uh, how you can regulate the um, <clears throat> case here of um, male versus female um, sex determination. You actually miss the females here. Why am I missing the females? Probably because there's a sex lethal mutation and the, you know, the females aren't there. So <clears throat> the default case, um, in the absence of sex lethal, and I also posted a little um, piece about why it's not just um, sex determination that's important for sex lethal here. Um, sex lethal is a splicing repressor. So it's a, these are all genes which are being made. Sex lethal is made, transformer is made, double sex is made. These are all genes that get transcribed. Whether you make an active protein from these transcribed genes depends on the presence of these different proteins. So in the presence of the sex lethal protein, the sex lethal transcript is blocked right here in terms of splicing. So it makes more of the sex lethal gene. And so that's over here in the female, which we just need to imagine. Imagine a female. Imagine a female fly. Um, so here in the female fruit fly, the sex lethal protein blocks this splicing, leads to more production of sex lethal. So it's a positive feedback loop here. The presence of sex lethal leads to more production of sex lethal. That sex lethal protein will then interact with this tra transcript. Again, you don't have sex lethal in males because you didn't start out making sex lethal, and that's what this whole thing is happening up here at the top, X chromosome to autosome ratio. No sex lethal, no splicing, no more sex lethal. With splicing, <clears throat> lots of sex lethal leading to your extra splicing in transformer. The presence of transformer will give you 
extra splicing. So transform is a splicing activator. It will activate splicing that happens right here in the double sex messenger RNA, leading to female specific, over here, female specific, uh, double sex protein. So it's activity of a splicing repressor, which was also self-regulating, and a splicing activator, giving you two different ends to your protein. And this is now a transcriptional repressor. If it's got male specific in the default case, this will repress female genes over here, which you can't see behind the curtain, um, is the female specific DNA binding region, which we talked about before, you know, all of our transcriptional regulators, those DNA binding and activity can be very separated relative to each other. Here, it's going to be female specific, so it represses all of the male genes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, so, the, so the, these are, the mRNAs are actually made for all three of these. It's which ones get translated up here. Sex lethal doesn't get translated in males. Transformer doesn't get translated in males. Double sex is translated in both males and females. And it's going to depend on where the splicing is. And so if splicing happens here, you splice out this extra intron and you end up with the male-specific exon. And, and then that 150 AA, are those sort of functionally basically like a UD ligand in that sense? They're, they're binding, are they the ones binding to the sequence, or are they just a signal? Um, you know what I'm saying? It's like OK, yeah, so I guess, sorry, I'm, I'm going to try and paraphrase your question here. So these 150 amino acids, they are your DNA binding domain for double sex. And the, I forget how many amino acids it is for the females, similar numbers, um, is the DNA binding, in that case motif, because 30 amino acids is usually not enough to actually form a structure, uh, that will then bind to the male-specific gene. Yeah? There are no functional, pro sorry, so the, the whole thing is, are there no functional proteins at all here? Um, double sex is functional. Double sex functions as a repressor of female-specific genes. But these two are non-functional. So double sex and the male is not created. The only one that would be is the functional protein that represses the female. That is correct, yes. And the female, there's functional proteins in sex, transformer, and double sex. Exactly. Yeah, so there, there is splicing that happens here. It's the, it's the constitutive splicing. And so there's no regulation of splicing that's happening here. So, um, and it is, in fact, very strange that the fly is making these messenger RNAs. They get spliced and make something which is non-functional. Seems kind of wasteful. But it, boy, why it's so maybe hard to wrap your brain around. But again, evolution just has to work. It doesn't have to be optimal. Sorry, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. <laughs> is it more, is the test determination more dependent on the alternative splicing type, or is it just kind of a function of both whether the proteins produced are functional and whether they splice? Do they all splice the same way? Uh, okay, so I'll, 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 I'll try, and, try and answer the question here. So the messenger RNAs are made for all three of these. So you always have those messenger RNAs that are made. They all get spliced. These guys, when they get spliced in the male, are non-functional. They don't make functional protein. Okay. This one down here does make functional protein. If you have alternative splicing, which is what happens in the females because of the presence of sex lethal, then you'll make functional proteins from this mRNA. You make a functional protein from this messenger RNA. And you have a different splicing here, which gives you a different function okay. for the protein which is made here. 
Oh, uh, so, so the, question, the question here really has to do with you know, how you get this signal in the first place. You know, where does that actually come from? And so x to autosome ratio here um, being 0.5, and you can, you can think of this just like what's happening in humans. So um, in a male, you're going to have xy. So you only have one x relative to autosomes. There are two copies of all of those. So you have a 0.5. In the female, you have two x's and then two of the autosomes. So that'll be one. Okay, let's, let's, yeah, well, okay, that, that, we can, we can, why don't we talk more about that offline rather than spending half of class on this, unless people really want to. We can spend the rest of today talking about this if people like. Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to talk about that o offline, and we can go through exact the details on that. Uh, but I think now let's move on and talk about some of the other things, because at most there'll be 10 questions on, no, sorry, sex lethal. <laughs> One or two, max. Um, so uh, messenger RNA um, cleavage, this actually has, um, it's a similar kind of process to regulation of your messenger RNA. This is going to be now determining where your <clears throat> stop codon is, and that's going to determine whether your antibodies are being secreted or stuck left to the cell. And this all has to do with the process of mRNA modification happening while you're transcribing. So if you are transcribing, there's a low concentration of the cleavage stimulation factor, which is important for poly-A tails. The transcript is going to be made. You'll have splicing that takes place. This intron will be gone. You'll get to this stop codon. This is where you're going to start making your poly-A tail. If, however, you have high CSTF before the cell has a chance to splice out this intron, you'll have CSTF binding and formation of poly A tail. So the place that it's going to bind is going to be right here in this intron. If the intron's gone, CSTF is not going to be able to do anything there. If the intron is still around because you have high amounts of CSTF, then you'll make the poly A tail over here. And all that does is give you, again, a different C terminus. And in this case, it's not a DNA binding C terminus. It's a C terminus which is now going to be associated with membrane or not associated with membrane. So it's cleavage of your messenger RNA, your cleavage of the messenger RNA, depending on the concentrations of these enzymes. Yeah. Yeah, so these are just different amino acids. This dark green here are different amino acids on either end because you're not, it's not the same messenger RNA. That same messenger RNA is going to have a different code. It's going to give you different amino acids, which will have different functions. That's all, I think, that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, messenger RNA stability, again, we talked about this being mostly unstable in bacteria. In eukaryotes, it's highly variable. In the... Normal case in a eukaryotic messenger RNA, you basically have a race between degradation of your poly A tail and translation. This is what normally happens. After you get to a short poly A tail, about 30 A's, then you have very rapid degradation that happens of your transcript. If, however, you have a regulatory RNA cleavage site in your 3' prime UTR, for that matter, really anywhere in your messenger RNA, but you're usually going to have it in the UTR. If you now skip this shortening step by chopping off the end, then you'll have very rapid degradation of your RNA. So this is a way to regulate how much of this RNA you have. The 
risk complexes, which we're probably not going to get to today, basically do this process if they've got a really good match between the small RNA that's in the risk complex and this particular piece of your RNA. As soon as an RNA gets cut, it's going to get degraded really, really rapidly. So here are the small RNAs that have also just disappeared. Really small, really, really, really small. Yeah, tiny little ones. And so the, um, the idea here is that those small RNAs that are associated either with the RNA-induced silencing complex, which is risk, or the RNA-induced transcriptional silencing, which are two separate pathways. If you've got short matches, if you have a short match in that short RNA, it's going to lead to translational repression, going to P-bodies. You have an extensive match. That's going to lead to degradation of that RNA if it's in a risk complex. And so that could be like degradation of the RNAs that we just talked about a second ago. Um, or if it's in the RNA-induced transcriptional silencing complex, that gets back to those RNAs that are being expressed even in introns all throughout the cell. If you have a repeated sequence anywhere in the cell, you're going to have short RNAs that are going to be double-stranded relative to each other. Those will bind to the Ritz complex. That will bind to messenger RNA and then bring in histone modification complexes, DNA methyltransferases, etc., and shut down transcription at that particular part. So this is the background level of transcripts that form from repeated sequences that are present in the genome, and I can talk a lot more about that um, later if people would like me to. Uh, <clears throat> we didn't get a chance to talk about the CRISPRs being used for genome editing. Um, a couple of people asked me in office hours about the difference between what's going on with CRISPR-Cas and RNA-induced silencing complexes. The big difference here is that you're working on DNA. So instead of the RNA-RNA interactions leading to degradation or lack of translation, here we have short RNAs that are made from transcription, which will then cleave DNAs. And this is really great for genome engineering because you can now make an RNA here together with some of these proteins to chop up whatever DNA sequence you want to chop. And so this is an extremely useful technique for changing genomes that actually don't have these sequences in them. And that's the eukaryotic system. The CRISPR-Cas is all in bacteria and archaea. It's not present in eukaryotes, so you can bring in these separate RNAs with the proteins and then cleave the eukaryotic DNA in very, very specific places. This picture, strangely enough, did appear, as opposed to all the other ones which disappeared. Uh, this is one that I wanted to show you last time in terms of chromatography. Um, here <clears throat> we have our column, solid matrix, something in there, which is going to slow down the elution of this mixture of different proteins. Here they're all together, which is why it's black. And then slowly green is going to get separated from red, because green is held up more than the red. And so you have your test tube here collects the stuff at the bottom. A little bit later, collects a little bit more. A little bit later, it gets red. A little bit later, ends up with green. This is exactly what's happening in all of our ion exchange chromatography, in size exclusion chromatography, affinity chromatography, et cetera. It's all about separating what you put on the top here based on whatever the matrix is. In some cases, that'll be binding, like you have an ion exchange and affinity, or it's just gel filtration. The big bits go through faster than the small bits do. Fusion proteins, which have also gotten eaten. Uh, <clears throat> here, fusion proteins is basically, again, what everyone, almost everyone does today uh, with protein purification, is you add a little tag to the end of your protein here. Again, a very, very little tag. You can't see it. It's so small. Uh, and then use that on your column chromatography to bind your favorite protein with this extra tag. And then you can use that to separate it from everything else, which may or may not show up here. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. Um, so this is the protein that you're looking for. 
It's a whole mixture of different proteins on SDS page. So when you have your cell extract, actually this is not a cell extract. Most cell extracts are way more different proteins in there than this one. Uh, centrifugation, you can separate some things here. And then you'll do a column chromatography, end up with a lot fewer proteins, a lot more of your protein here. Do gel filtration, you can get rid of some of the big stuff and some of the little stuff here. And then with your affinity chromatography, you end up with just one band here, relative molecular weight of 40,000. Shouldn't be bound to other proteins because you've boiled it in SDS and beta mercaptoethanol, so it shouldn't have any kind of other proteins that are associated with it. So this you can now use for all of your assays, figuring out what kind of other proteins it's going to interact with, what kind of enzymatic activity it has, et cetera. But also really very important is trying to determine the structure of whatever it is. Usually in this case, if we've done a tag protein, we actually have the sequence of this particular protein. But in some cases, and particularly earlier on, we didn't know what the sequences were for a lot of these proteins. And the easiest way to do that these days is to take your protein, chop it into little pieces, and then determine the molecular mass of each of those pieces with extremely high precision. And that's what modern mass spectrometers do. Then you can compare these sequences to predicted sequences that you would have gotten from, say, expression of all the genes in the human genome, or expression of all the genes in the sulfalobus genome, or expression of all the genes in the sulfalobus virus genomes, which is exactly what we do. Um, and then, say, this is the protein with these pieces in it corresponds to only one gene that you can find in the human genome, the sulfalobus genome, whatever it happens to be that you got this protein from in the first place. And so this is a great way to identify proteins, or when you have this protein right here, to figure out that this really is the protein that you purified, that you wanted to purify, and it's not some kind of contaminant, which has happened in the past. So we talked about the two hybrid screens already. Any questions on this before I move on to the um, nucleotide gel electrophoresis? Take home messages here, we've really got three different kinds, but two different kinds of matrix here for separating things. Agarose gel electrophoresis is your standard thing. Anyone taking the mutant viruses from a hell lab next term is going to do a whole lot of these. Um, taking your DNA, cutting it with a restriction endonuclease, so you've got between 500 and 10,000 base pair pieces, separating them all relative to each other. If you have a mutant, then one of these bands is going to be different. And that's the whole point of the lab next term. Um, acrylamide gel electrophoresis, this is what people use for DNA sequencing because any piece of nucleotide that has one nucleotide difference is going to be in a slightly different place on this gel. And so this will be, say, 39 nucleotides long. That'll be 40. That'll be 41, 42, 43. Although here, the numbers are slightly different. Um, these are pulse field gel electrophoresis for separating really, really big DNAs relative to each other. Libraries, we talked about really briefly, sort of two flavors of libraries. You've got your genomic library, which is all of the DNA from one particular cell split up into little pieces, usually by using different restriction endonucleases that you then will cut, put into a plasmid, and then you've got millions of plasmids, then you can pull out the ones that you're interested in, usually by using hybridization. If you want to know what the messenger RNAs are that are present in any cell at any given time, you can make a cDNA library and clone all of these things into plasmids, or, as we talked about in the very first slide, just sequence the heck out of them and get lots and lots of sequences through this high-throughput sequencing um, technology. We talked about DNA sequencing at the beginning. This would be the last one that we have. We can talk a lot more about fly sex determination and X to A ratios and what the answers to questions on previous exams will be in office hours now or in office hours next week or online. Um, see all of you on Wednesday. <laughs>